Hi everyone, today I will be discussing the fascinating case of indiscretion of an American wife, also known as Stazione Termini to Italian audiences. This film was a co-production between famed American producer David O. Selznick, who is of course well known for Gone with the Wind and Rebecca, both of which won Academy Awards for Best Picture, and celebrated Italian director Vittorio De Sica, who had also won special Academy Awards for his films, Shusha, also known as Shushine, and Laundry di Bicicletti, also known as Bicycle Thieves. Despite its promise to unite neorealist and Hollywood cinema, the film was largely a failure in terms of box office returns and critical receptions in both countries. In fact, this film has been considered an anomaly in De Sica's career. The failure of the film was compounded because of the contentious relationship between De Sica and Selznick, which would culminate in De Sica releasing his own longer version of the film. Most research on this film has focused on the aesthetic and political differences between Hollywood and neorealist cinema as the basis of its failure. But as Dr. Catherine O'Ra has pointed out through her masterfully researched article, this film also showcases the undervaluing of female stardom and women's cinema in general in post-war Italy. As her analysis of Selznick's memos written during the filming show, this was actually the basis of the battle between De Sica and Selznick. This lecture will solidify many of the themes that we have been discussing throughout our course on neorealism. I will revisit some of the history of neorealism's distribution abroad with a focus on the United States. I am also going to use the case study of indiscretion of an American wife slash Stazione Termini to highlight the place of female actors and women's stories within the movement. Here is today's agenda, and as you can see, I will be discussing both of these issues alongside a closer look at the editing style of the film. Um, and we're going to be using sort of both versions of the film to, to do this analysis. And I'm also going to be looking at how the film was marketed in the United States. I will close out the lecture with some asynchronous exercises that I would like you to do, which include using digital archives to examine the promotion of this film, as well as reflecting on some questions that students have submitted. Even if you are not a student in my class, since I am posting this lecture on uh, YouTube, I hope that you enjoy this lecture and you will still be able to participate in the asynchronous exercises if you're interested. So in this part of the lecture, I'm going to be exploring neorealism and Hollywood. So Vittoria De Sica, of course, is one of the most internationally recognized neorealist directors. As we've explored throughout the course, he started his uh, filmmaking career under the fascist regime at the famed uh, Cinecitta Studios. And his working relationship with uh, Cesare uh, Zavattini helped to create the first two neorealist films to be recognized with special Academy Awards. De Sica's uh, Shusha was the first ever special Oscar for a non-English film, with Laundry di Bicicletti winning another special Oscar two years later. As we have looked at previously in the course, Zavattini was particularly anti-Hollywood and anti-star in his writings on neorealism, which proposed that audiences needed to be liberated from the very concept of stardom. So it was very interesting for De Sica to choose to go to Hollywood and eventually make a film based on a story written by Zavattini, which uh, this film was, was based on a story written by Zavattini with Hollywood actors. Um, playing the starring roles. At the end of what would be classically defined as the neorealist era of Italian film, De Sica was invited to Hollywood by Howard Hughes in, the Mar in March of 1952. His trip was described in this article from the exhibitor as a fact-finding mission. It says that De Sica originally hoped to shoot the film on location in the United States and was taking meetings with various studios. He also uh, shared some interesting insights on the dubbing of his films in the United States. 
Um, he recognized that subtitles help to attract what he called a quote unquote special audience. Um, and in this, he's, I think, referring to the urban American audience who were interested in the more authentic um, uh, subtitle cinematic experience. Um, but he notes that he would like his films to be dubbed after the first run to attract a wider popular audience. He also reflects in this article on the production code, and while he says that he will abide by it for his proposed American film, he notes that it was extraordinarily strict, and um, he references how Bicycle Thieves was not able to get a seal because um, of a public urination scene. Um, the article also notes uh, that DeSica was talking to many different uh, studios and he was really interested originally to actually shoot a film on location in the United States. So it was announced in the trade papers in October of 1952 that it was Selznick who made the deal with DeSica. Um, and this was part of a larger deal of two Italian films that were to star his wife, Jennifer Jones. The first of these films was Terminal Station, um, of course, to be directed by DeSica. And the second was a film um, entitled Mary Magdalene, which was supposed to be directed by Giuseppe Amato, but this film was never made. In December 1953, um, stills from the film uh, were published um, in Motion Picture Daily uh, detailing the eight-week shoot that happened in Rome. Um, this article also mentions that De Sica did have difficulty directing in English um, and mentions that he used French to converse with Montgomery Clift um, and he used an interpreter to speak with Jennifer Jones. By December of 1953, it was announced that Columbia Pictures would distribute the film. So now I wanted to provide a little bit of a refresher on Nathaniel Brennan's article on neorealism and its appeal and distribution um, in the United States. As DeSica referenced in his article um, that we were just mentioning, uh, neorealist films were a commercial success in urban centers with middle class and upper middle class audiences um, who, quote unquote, were deemed uh, sophisticated. Nathaniel Brennan also talks um, about how American film culture um, moved towards a more sustained engagement with cinematic realism after the war and these highly polished escapist fantasies um, and the reliance on artificial sentiment that was so prevalent in Hollywood um, was no longer popular in a world forever changed by the war. Effective marketing strategies played a large role in the popularity of neorealism in the United States. Um, and the advertising rhetoric of post-war Italian cinema was anchored in two seemingly contradictory polls. One emphasized this critical merit um, that was attracting this quote-unquote sophisticated audience, but the other relied on suggestions of the more sordid nature of the cinematic content. So sexualized images of Italian women were particularly used to promote post-war Italian films, uh, both in the United States and in Canada. Um, and here we can see an American promotional poster for the film uh, Bitter Rice, and actress uh, Silvana Mangano became a sex symbol um, in North America after uh, this film was released. Professor Robert Schuyler also notes that Italian neorealism's um, appeal was largely based um, to American intellectuals. And his article um, on the U.S. response to neorealism and the film critic, author, and screenwriter James Agee um, explores this idea. Schuyler documents the role of, that Agee played in promoting neorealism through his critical writings for publications like The Nation and Time Magazine. Um, and he also examines how James Agee was a link between the aesthetic theory of neorealism and um, eventual production um, through his role as a screenwriter for documentary films like The Quiet One and In the Street. And both of these films depict childhood poverty and were very much um, influenced by uh, De Sica's work. 
So in this section of the lecture, I'm going to examine women's place in neorealism, drawing on um, both our previous discussions in this course on the Italian Cinema Audience Project and through looking at Catherine O'Rah's amazing uh, piece, uh, Italian Neorealism and Women's Film, Selznick de Sica and Stezione Termini. As we have looked at previously um, in the course, uh, the Italian cinema audience, unlike other countries, had very much a male-dominated audience. And um, some women felt left out of this uh, cinematic culture. Um, and they also felt that they were sort of unable to criticize uh, the films because of the male-dominated nature of the Italian critical elite who venerated both neorealism and also the great directors that would spring out of the movement. In this quote, we see a female spectator attribute her dislike of Fellini to a lack of intelligence on her part. Many women felt left out of the neorealist movement, and there was really not a concerted effort by many Italian directors associated with the movement to appeal to female audiences. Um, and we've also sort of explored the theme throughout the course that even though melodrama was a popular form of cinema in Italy, it was not valued, and neorealist films that brought in melodramatic elements were often heavily criticized. As Catherine O'Rourke points out, um, and I quote, women's films with a focus on female protagonists, female point of view, and crucially a female address did not exist in Italian cinema. Many post-war Italian films did not portray women's experiences. Um, and again, those that did were often uh, critiqued by the uh, critical elite. Of course, there are some exceptions um, to a lack of female stars, like Clara Calamai and Anna Magnani, to name a couple of examples. But as Aurora writes, and I quote, a gendered viewpoint was generally marginalized by the hegemonic left-wing Italian criticism, which also showed its distaste for melodrama. It is probably no coincidence that Obsessione, Bitter Rice, and Mignani's vehicle, Lorovole Angelina, have a somewhat contestant status within the critical canon of high neorealism. The power of female stardom was far more powerful in the United States, as Catherine O'Ra works point out. Um, many of Selznick's disagreements with the film were largely due to how Jennifer Jones was being shot. Selznick was particularly concerned with how American women would receive this film, and um, again, this was the basis for much of his meddling during the productions. He worried that Zavattini's stories would not connect with a female audience. And Aurar points out through several memos in her work that Selznick wanted a female writer to work on the screenplay. And he also thought that despite Zavattini's gift as a writer, he was unable to effectively write romance. Um, in this section, I'm going to show some images from Jones from previous films to highlight how lighting created the female star effect in Hollywood. Um, and I also wanted to point out that if you would like to find out more about Selznick's relationship with Jones, I'm going to link in the description box a podcast um, called You Must Remember This, um, which has an episode dedicated to the couple. Um, I want to make sure that I'm being very clear that even though Selznick was interested in highlighting Jennifer Jones in the film and was concerned with having a female perspective, um, this does not make him some sort of feminist icon. Um, in fact, his relationship with Jones, who started out as his contract player, often demonstrates how Selznick had a pattern of exploitation that was very much deeply rooted in a misogynistic system um, that was Hollywood. Despite this, I do think it is important to interrogate how female stars and women's stories were treated in the neorealist movement, um, but this does not negate the fact that Hollywood was also um, misogynistic in nature. So 
As Catherine O'Rourke points out in her piece, um, most of Selznick memos were concerned with uh, the cinematographer G.R. Aldo and particularly how he was um, providing close-up shots of Jennifer Jones in the films. Um, Aldo, instead of sort of focusing on Jones, was instead focused on highlighting the location of uh, uh, Termini Station through depth of focus and lighting. Um, but the problem in his work, according to Selznick, was that he f failed to properly light Jennifer Jones in her close-up scenes. So Selznick, um, to remedy this, brought in an uncredited cameraman, Oswald Ozzy Morris, to oversee uh, Jennifer's shots. Selznick wrote in a memo that he brought in Ozzy because it would jeopardize Jennifer's career by having Aldo photograph her. Selznick also consulted with cinematographer Lee Garms, who had previously shot um, Jennifer Jones. He recommended that they use Rembrandt lighting, which is um, back lighting to create a softer effect, or it can also be um, lit from the side. Um, he also recommended that Eastman diffusers rather than Mitchell um, diffusers, which is what um, Aldo, Aldo was using. Um, he said that the uh, Mitchell diffusers were actually creating a flat image um, lacking in definition. O'Rourke no notes that along with the lighting and uh, the use of different equipment, um, the conditions of the location shoot also exacerbated the cinematography issues with Jennifer um, because she was often freezing, which caused her cheeks to be distorted and her skin to be blotchy. The same effect happened um, to other actresses shooting with neorealist directors like Ingrid Bergman, um, who is seen here in Rossellini Str Stromboli. As O'Rourke writes, um, the suffering of female stars was thus part and parcel of the neorealist experience. Um, so now in this section, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the editing style um, through looking at um, the wonderful uh, video essay done by Kangonda on the, the film, which um, can be found on Vimeo, which I'm going to link in the description notes. So here are some scenes from Kangonda's uh, video where you can see um, Desika's version on the left and Selznick version of the film on the right. As Catherine O'Rourke points out, um, Kaganda in this video is really continuing with many of the same arguments that we've seen with Italian critics um, who have focused on the uh, how the spectacle of Hollywood could never be compatible with the purity of neorealism. And so Kaganda starts out this video by saying, and I quote, there was a clash of sensibilities so great that it resulted in two cuts of the same film. Um, despite this, I think, legitimate critique that Ara um, says, I do think that this video essay does demonstrate um, the contrast in editing styles uh, between both versions of the film. So we can see in the De Sica version um, that there are, that many of the scenes are much longer, um, he's using long takes, um, and he also does not, uh, you know, give the audience context about what Mary is doing um, by going to Giovanni's apartment. Um, but in Selznick version, we see that this is explained through a cut to her letter to him, and Selznick also makes it clear that the film is taking place in Rome. Um, consequently, through watching both versions, we see that Selznick is cutting the film and as Kaganda states, is removing these in-between moments um, and background characters, which help bring to light the larger story. I also wanted to explore some of the neorealist themes that are shown in the film. As we've looked at throughout the course, a key tenant of neorealism is showing the struggles of ordinary Italians. We see some of this as Mary goes into the third class waiting room and encounters an Italian minor and his wife. In this scene, the audience is exposed to the stories of poverty, which were, of course, central to the neorealist movement. This almost throwaway scene is an interesting divergence to the film's um, overall narrative. She needs a doctor. First aid station down there. I think she has baby right here. <laughs> no, 
Ma che dici? È incinta di quattro mesi. She pregnant. Only four months. Where do you come from? England, coal miner. No more work coal mine. I have come back to Italy. We'd better take her to the first aid. Another plot point in the film is the overreach of Italian police forces in arresting the couple for their indiscretion. We are also taken back into an Italian police station, which has become a familiar location in many of the films that we've watched so far throughout the semester. Although, like in every other case, we see the police show some sort of compassion when they allow Mary to leave without being charged. A very stark contrast to how Giuseppe and Pasquale were treated in Shusha. Comodi, no? Sit down, Mrs. Forbes. Why are you to the station? Lady's here to catch a train. Where to? Harris. Are you separated from your husband? No. Any children? No. Yes, one. Does your husband know that you are in Rome? Yes. Chef Commissario. Cos'è? Eh, verbale. Io ho sottoscritto. ID on sign, Giulio Vallardi di Giuseppe. Hugh Brackman at the Rome station, testifying good faith the following. At 7.30 p.m., while on a tour of inspection, I found in a third-class compartment of an empty car a man and a woman who were... He proceeded to arrest them and they brought them to this police station for the appropriate measures. Men and the woman who then it is only a question of your fine. I'd be glad to pay anything. Oh, but this is a different matter. This is not a ticket. This is a formal charge. Tickets you can pay to a police agent. But on a formal charge, the penalty must be determined by the judge. There must be a trial. This lady is married. She has a child. If such a statement is made public, I think the consequences would be very bad for her. But all this war, we made such an effort. What time does you try and leave? 8.30. You still plan to take it? So 
So in this section of the uh, lecture, I'm going to be talking about the marketing campaign for Indiscretion of American Wife, which was also very much female centric. And um, out of all of the sort of the exploitation tactics that were employed by both uh, Selznick and Columbia Pictures, uh, the central theme was asking women, you know, what they would do in this situation. Um, the other interesting thing that Catherine Ara notes in um, her work is that Selznick advocated for um, the U.S. trailer uh, to add this line that De Sica, um, very much absurdly, was the world's most romantic director. Again, very much trying to appeal to this female audience. So... The promotion of Hollywood films was done through dedicated departments called exploitation departments, and these were located in each studio. Um, I've written about these departments uh, before, particularly in my piece on the Warner Brothers films Captains of the Clouds. Um, exploitation departments emerged in the late 1910s as a mean to sell pictures directly to the public rather than relying solely on exhibitors. These departments generally comprised of four divisions. Um, there was an administrative division, a publication division, a publicity division, and then finally there was this field force that was sent out directly to the theaters to work with exhibitors to sell films. And so by the 1940s, all of the studios had exploitation departments that helped with publicity and created stunts for exhibitors to use to help increase ticket sales. So in the case of Indiscretion of American Wife, I found several examples um, of articles instructing exhibitors on how to promote the film. Um, this first example shows the press book from Columbia Pictures, which created these kiss still ads for theaters to run in newspapers with the key line, and I quote, suddenly the whole world know her secret. A lobby display was also suggested in this article um, entitled The Movie Kiss of the Year, which told exhibitors to pair Jones and Clift with other famous love duos like Boyer and Lamar um, from the film Algiers and Gable and Lee in Gone with the Wind. Um, in addition, there was a perfect lover's contest um, that was created to plant in newspapers. And finally, at the bottom of the page, um, you will see this four-page uh, tabloid mock-up, um, which they say in the article, and I quote, will make them believe it actually happened. So here is an example of um, what Lowe's Theatres in Boston did for their promotional campaign on the film. Um, and so this, this article also demonstrates how Selznick inclusion of two songs along with video footage um, sung by Patti Page was used to sell the picture through special advertising in music stores and on radio stations playing this song. I actually started off uh, the lecture with uh, this music. This article also mentions um, that the tabloid mock-ups that I just mentioned in the previous slide um, were distributed on the streets of Boston and apparently over 10,000 copies were printed. Um, the reporter in this article uh, describes what they call, and I quote, a prime ballyhoo stunt um, which had a girl in a t-shirt and shorts um, with a see-through raincoat, um, which had written on it. If you think I'm indiscreet, wait until you see indiscretion of an American wife. Um, and apparently this uh, woman went around Boston uh, distributing uh, the fake tabloids. Um, another example was another um, female marketer who went around town adding nickels uh, to parking meters that were about to run out. And uh, she would leave a card on the car, uh, car saying, just in case your overtime parking is an indiscretion of an American wife, the management of Lowe's Theatres has deposited five cents in the parking meter to save you embarrassment. So, um, you know, I wanted to add uh, some asynchronous exercises for you to get into the action. Um, 
And for the students in my class, uh, this is going to be your part of your course engagement um, for this week. But even if you're not in my class, uh, you can definitely play along and uh, look for your own articles about this film, as well as respond uh, to some of the questions um, that students in my class submitted this week for us to discuss. So I've created this primary source uh, research link module on my uh, Quarkus site um, for my class. And so students can head over there and use the link databases uh, to find one article about indiscretion of American wife. Um, you can also use the uh, Italian title um, Stazione uh, Termini to see if you know if you can find different different articles um, as well and remember to also add names of the actor and directors to help narrow your search. Um, you can find an interesting review, promotional material, or another type of article mentioning the film. Um, there will be a shared research folder in Quarkus for you to upload your document. And please make sure to include your name in the file name. So have the periodical title, the page number, the date, and then add your name at the end um, of your file name. Um, if you're not in my class, the Media History Digital Library is free and open to the public. Um, and there are also many historical newspapers available through ProQuest. Um, and if you do not have access to ProQuest uh, through an institution, um, please check with your local library because many local libraries subscribe. And I'm going to include um, both links down in the description box. So here are also some questions that students submitted about the film. Um, and I'm gonna also add these to the description box. Um, for students in my class, please choose one and write two to three sentences um, in the asynchronous response document linked on Quarkus. Again, if you're not in my class, uh, please feel free to write uh, your response down in, in the comments. I'm really interested to hear you know, how people think this film fits in with the larger history of neorealism. And one of the students asked this week, you know, would um, the Selznick version of Indiscretion of American Wife even be considered a neorealist film? Um, another really interesting question was, you know, how do these two versions of the film, how are they distinctly Hollywood and how are they distinctly neorealist in style, um, looking at both versions? Um, the third question that I thought was really interesting was, you know, how this film is really part of this larger history of a lack of women-centered stories in neorealist films. And, you know, how does this film interact with the gender bias um, that we've seen in neorealist cinema? So thank you so much for watching, and I hope you enjoyed learning more about the production and promotion of this fascinating film. Uh, please like this video and subscribe to my channel for more teaching and film-related content.